Despite, the, despite their small size, Hellenistic literary epigrams could at times develop larger themes from Greek literature, especially when anthologized as a series. As an example, I offer a set of five interrelated epigrams by Meliager concerning the god Eros, AP 5176 through 180. No other continuous Meliagrian sequence reaches this length, and the poems appear to have formed an important nodule within the Garland's erotic book. As a kind of epigrammatic discourse on the nature of love, they rework themes from earlier Greek poetry, art, and philosophy. By personalizing these themes through the persona of the epigrammatic lover, they transmit the tradition about Eros in a format that influenced the later Greek and Latin literary tradition. The Eros presented in the series is clearly the willful boy god who appears in Hellenistic poetry and art. But Meliager also draws extensively <coughs> from earlier sophistic and philosophical discussions of the god. The so-called erotikoi logoi emerged in the fifth century as debates about the nature of Eros, arising at least partially because he played no role in early epic and received little in the way of cult worship. He see it conceived of, of Eros as a primal, primal force of nature and placed him beside Earth as one of the first entities to arise out of chaos. In archaic and classical art, Eros was depicted as a winged adolescent, sometimes in the company of Aphrodite, but his later <laughs> attributes of torch and bow and his nature as a child developed mainly in the early Hellenistic era. This, the type of subject addressed in the erotikoi logoi was generally Eros' psychological effect as it related to his physical appearance rather than his role as a cosmic force. Surviving examples of such discourse, Gorgias' encomium to Helen, Plato's symposium, and Phaedrus' Xenophon's, Xenophon's symposium are very familiar texts. But titles from lost works reveal the continuing popularity of the topic in the later fourth century and in Hellenistic philosophy. Another influence on the epigrams in Meliager's sequence are monologues from Greek comedy, which indicate widespread knowledge of philosophical discussions about eros. In a fragment from Ebulus, from Ebulus and another from Alexis, painters are accused of being ignorant of the god's true being because they wrongly depict him with wings when, in fact, uh, he's never able to fly away. In Alexis's Phaedrus, a character who expressly draws on topoi found in philosophical discourse reflects on the mistake of painting Eros at all, since he is neither male nor female, god nor human, stupid nor wise, but a composite of many forms. Mythical accounts of the god also, also appear in comedy, as in a fragment of Aristophon's Pythagoristes, which contains a story of the Olympian shearing arrows of his wings to banish him from heaven. Although the identity of these comic monologue speakers is unknown, they do suggest models for the lover's voice in our sequence. Meliager was also influenced by the more developed mythical narratives of Eros found in Hellenistic sources, such as Apollonius' Argonautica and poems about Eros <coughs> in the later bucolic corpus, especially Moschus' Drapetes, The Runaway Eros. These poems contributed the motif of Aphrodite's difficulty in controlling her unruly son and narrative personifications of the psychological effects of Eros' arrows in stimulating desire. After this very abbreviated summary of what went before, I turn to a reading of Meliager's five poems as a unified sequence, pointing out their connections one to another, the reworking of the earlier discourse on Eros, and the presence of themes taken up in later texts. Recurring motifs in the sequence include the god's laugh, questions about his parentage, and the paradoxes of his being. I would argue that the sequence was a linchpin in the adaptation of philosophical discussion on Eros to representations of, internal, of the internal emotional experience of the lover. The first epigram, 5176, is a lover's generalizing reflection on his long familiarity with Eros's power and cruelty. Its opening cry of denos eros denos is apparently uttered in the throes of some unspecified emotional crisis and leads to the lover's acknowledgement that such reproaches are useless. The failure to stem love's power with complaint is then more commonly imaged as a fantasy of the god's reaction to verbal abuse, his laughter, his pleasure, and an increase in his strength. Finally, the lover's mood shifts, <coughs> wondering that Eros' genealogy is a paradox. How could fire be created from water? The epith 
said donos in the opening reproach, repeated both in the present moment and as remembrance of past occasions, is a traditional one for the god. Alcius refers to Eros as the most dreadful of the gods, and he is called denos three times in Euripides once in Plato. A close equivalent, Cyrus Amor, appears frequently in Latin poetry. I call particular attention to the Song of Daemon in Eclogue 8, where the lamenting lover declares that he has come to understand the god's nature, nunc scio quid sit amor, just before illustrating the murderous cruelty of the Cyrus Amor. <coughs> Yubo in 1921 argued that the speech of Daemon showed for Virgil's familiarity with several epigrams in um, the a slightly larger garland sequence that includes our five poems. And I will return uh, to uh, Meliager's influence uh, on Eclogue 8 later in the paper. The motif of the god's laughter, which is identified in the second couplet as his habitual response to the lover's reproaches, is surprisingly rare in earlier sources. It is found, however, in Moschus's Drapetes, where laughter and tears are two of Eros's tricks to escape from capture. Among later examples is an epigram by Chronagoras, in which binding Eros, a theme also we'll see later, binding Eros is justified on the basis that the god responds to mortal pain with his laughter. Meliadra's emphasis on Eros's laugh, appearing in all five epigrams, likely lies in the background also of Cupid's laughter in key Ovidian poems. In Amores 1-1, Cupid reportedly turned the poet from epic to elegy by laughing and snatching away what foot. Recise Cupido Dicitor. The presence of Dicitor here <coughs> signals a source, and an additional hint uh, of Meliager's Denos Eros sequence is <coughs> Ovid's address in the very next line to Saiwe Puer. Similarly, in 218, Amor laughs at Ovid's tragic costume, again to turn him to elegy, and his laugh occurs also in 1 6. Ovid's programmatic use of Cupid's laugh as a mark of his generic choice to write love elegy seems related to its repeated presence in Meliager's sequence. Turning to the final couple in 5176, we can see that it reduces a long history about Eros's origin to this conceit of fire emerging from water, encapsulating the mythical stories about his birth, as well as his mother's, his cosmic dimensions, and his paradoxical nature. Um, although there's no time really to go back and look at all the uh, elements in the earlier uh, <coughs> Logoi, uh, I will point to a third century poet, Antagoras, who proclaims in a poem supposedly reflecting the teachings of the academic Krantor that there existed two versions, two separate lines of uh, descent about Eros's origin. Either that he was among the first of the gods brought forth by night from the depths of ocean, or that he was the son of Aphrodite, earth, or the winds. So beginning here in this sequence, Meliadra molds almost all of these elements as he molds uh, uh, Antagoras' uh, two sides of the question. And he does so to reflect the god's power and elusiveness. So <coughs> 5176 serves as an introduction for the four epigrams to follow. The central three in the sequence, 177 through 179, might even be read as examples of the lover's earlier reproaches, his loi dora. 5177 and 178 are mime-like poems, often treated as an epigram pair. In both, the lover engages in role-playing, <coughs> first taking on the persona of a slave owner who proclaims the loss of a runaway child, and then that of an auctioneer who tries to sell the baby arrows. And both end with acknowledgement of the god's close relationship to Xenophila. Xenophila provides the only example of a love object in the epigram sequence, which as a whole deals generically with the lover's plight. 5177 mimics proclamations made to recover runaway slaves, some of which survive in written versions on papyri, and I brought you uh, one such version in the Greek, uh, which I will translate. It's from uh, second century Alexandria, second century BC. <coughs> A slave disappeared in Alexandria named Hermon and also called Nihilus. In origin, a Syrian from Bambuke, 18 years old, of average height, beardless, with strong calves, a dimpled chin, a wart by the left nostril, a scar on the left side of the mouth, tattooed on the right wrist, wearing a cloak and waistcloth. In his second couplet, Meliager adapts physical descriptions of this sort to a staccato listing of Eros's character and appearance. 
The information in such proclamations about a slave's ethnic origin is remodeled in the third couplet as the problem of whether Eros had a parent, and if so, who or what. Archaic poets invented divine parents for Eros in so many conflicting versions that Phaedrus and Plato's symposium concluded the god had no mother or father. Meliager personalizes this tradition by asserting that three alleged progenitors, ether, earth, and sea, all deny parentage. In so doing, he simultaneously recalls pre-Socratic accounts of Eros as a cosmic source, and he contradicts them. The lover's role playing as a herald is specifically indebted to the Grapetes, where Aphrodite proclaims Eros a runaway and promises the reward of a kiss for his capture. Both poems begin with the language of proclamation and the phrase with which Meliager introduces his description of the lost boy in the second couplet, esti hopais yukudraus, closely echoes the opening of the similar, though longer description given by Aphrodite, este do pais perisamos. The goddess concludes with a warning to avoid the dangers of the boy's tricks and weapons, and Meliager's lover, lover similarly issues a warning to beware of Eros's nets for snaring souls. Particularly Meliagrian, however, is the final twist when Eros is seen hiding in Sinopola's eyes. In this, Meliager seems indebted to Callimachus' epigram 1273, in which half of the poet's soul has run away, gone off to some boy, it seems. <clears throat> I suspect that Callimachus' last words, I know that it loiters somewhere there, meaning with the boy, lie behind Meliager's ending. You haven't escaped me, Archer, hiding in Sinopola's eyes. Meliager's shift turns the proclamation format into a mini-drama through the speaker's internal emotional change. It reveals that the poem has from the outset been over the only the lover's internal discourse about loss and renewal of desire, play acted as an allegory of the runaway Eros. In the companion epigram, 5178, modeled on an auction, the slave's qualities and competencies are again listed in the second and third couplets. An auctioneer's call to buyers looking for a special type of purchase is the model for the fourth couplet, where the lover seeks a merchant who plans to sail away, taking arrows with him, of course. Given Meliager's first career as a writer of Manipian prose, the primary model for this epigram was probably Manipus's sail of Diogenes, lost, of course, but we have hints of it in, uh, in Lucian's Sail of Philosophical Lives. This was about Diogenes the Cynic, who was reportedly captured and sold to a Corinthian. In Manippus' work, as Diogenes Laertius tells us, when the Cynic was asked by the auctioneer what he knew how to do, he replied, govern men, and then instructed the crier to seek a buyer who was in need of a master, that is, a specialized buyer. As the inversion of master and slave is an underlying theme in the anecdotes about Diogenes sale, so in the epigram, the lover, again by a change of heart in the final couplet, becomes slave to his slave, Eros. <coughs> the next epigram, 5179, is closely related structurally and in its ten line length to the preceding two. It is not a mime, however, but a dramatized conversation with the god that offers a continuation of the emotional journey. As both mimes end with an acknowledgement of Eros's continuing physical presence, so this epigram presents the frustrated lover's attempt to control the child god by threat of force. The physical immediacy of Eros, of desire itself, is made evident as the lover apostrophizes the god's laughter and sneering grin, which he gives in response to the initial threat to burn his weapons. The second threat, to clip his wings and bind his feet, leads to the realization that such an action would only result in yoking the god to his own soul, like a lynx near goats. In the concluding couplet, the defeated lover begs Eros to fly away to others, thus linking back to the opening of 5177, where Eros is said to have flown from his bed. This ring composition reinforces the resemblance between the central three epigraphs. It also <coughs> signals the end of the lover's willingness to play Eros's game and so prepares for the last poem in the series, where Eros is stripped of allure and remodeled as a god of destruction. The lover's threats of violence in 5179 have precedence in earlier mythical narratives where there were attempts to control Eros, but by gods, not by mortals. 
The threat to burn the god's bow and quiver is reminiscent of that passage in the Argonautica where Aphrodite reports to Hera and Athena such great frustration with her son's insolence that she feels an urge to break his bow and ill twanging arrows. Meliager's further threat to clip the god's wings recalls Aristophon's uh, Pythagoristes, where the 12 gods are commended for banishing arrows from heaven and clipping his wings so they cannot turn. Only here in the sequence does the lover address Eros throughout the poem, he cre and thus creates an internal dialogue with his own desire. The technique resembles speeches in comedy, in which characters express their emotions through a conversation with a mute character. Ovid, perhaps influenced by Meleager's epigram, takes this approach one step further in Amores 1-1 and in the opening of Remedia Mars. In both, the poet reports past conversations with Cupid, quoting not only his own words to the god, but the god's actual replies. Meleager's threats also recall earlier ecstatic motifs, suggesting a link to epigrams in which an artist is derided for his depiction of eros. A lost Hellenistic sculpture of the god tied to a pillar was the subject of five epigrams, of which the earliest is likely that by the Garland poet Alcaeus, 16196. On your handout. Alcaeus concludes by proclaiming the uselessness of the sculptor's labor in trying to fetter Eros and deprive him of his bow and arrows. Meliager's fantasy of escaping love's pain by restraining the god's power <coughs> situates the reader more intimately within the lover's emotionally dominated thought pattern. The epigram's oblique relationship to pictorial relation, uh, representations of Eros points also to another Latin elegy, and that is Propertius 2.12. Propertius begins by praising the painter of the boy god who saw, we did, the nature of lovers <coughs> and depicted Amor accordingly with wings, arrows, <coughs> and a quiver. At the midpoint of the elegy, Propertius reveals that his analysis of the painter's skill is based on his own experience Amor's weapons remain in him in May, as does an image of the boy, Carillus de Mago. And the god must have lost his wings, since he never flies from the poet's heart. Propertius's complaint that Eros never flies away to other lovers recalls the end of our epigram, where Meleager begs him to do so. Particularly of interest is Propertius's shift in line 17 to direct address of the god, recalling, I think, 5179. He begs Amor to cast his arrows against another, Alio Traite Natua, compounding the reminiscence of Meleager's last couplet about flying away by imitating its useless command. Propertius's final ploy is to point out that if Amor destroys him, there will be no one to sing erotic elegies as good as his. And the poem's conclusion reveals the real source of Amor's power as the lover focuses on the physical reality of the poela, her head fingers, dark eyes, and delicate walk. As um, 5179 adumbrates a number of Propertius's motifs, the final couplets in 5177 and 178 model the turn from complaint about the god to submission to the beloved at the poem's end. So I suggest po Propertius's poem is indeed indebted to several epigrams in Meliager's sequence. The summary quality of the final epigram is evident. The opening rhetorical question in 5180, asking why it would be strange that man slaying Eros hurls fire breathing uh, arrows and laughs bitterly, um, uh, links back to other epigrams in the sequence. The phrase tizenon recalls tizetopleon in the first line of 5176. The blazing arrows recall the empty threat to burn the god's weapon that opens the previous epigram 179, and the god's laugh is, as we have seen, a leitmotif throughout. The last poem also answers the sequence's recurring question about the god's parents by revealing that he has only a matrilineal <coughs> genealogy, a mother Aphrodite and a grandmother, the sea. The lover again reflects generically on the nature of Eros as in 5176, and the epigram may be read as a return to the same dramatic time frame as in that initial poem a time when reproaches and threats have ended and the lover has come to contemplate Eros's power with resigned acceptance. The main idea of this poem is to explain that Eros's affinity to fire and swords and his savage temperament derived from Aphrodite's relationships with Ares and Hephaestus and her birth from the raging sea. The compound brotoi logos in the first line, a Homeric epithet of Ares, signals the key role played by that god. Note that the final phrase 
uh, imatol forta bele, containing a unique compound, equates Ares' blood-smeared weapons with Theros' deadly barbs. The paradoxical likeness of the <coughs> god of love to the god of war is a rare motif in later epigram, but one example is the anonymous 917157, apparently imperial, where Eros's divinity is denied on the basis of his cruelty, since he smiles at human bloodshed, holds a sword in his hand, and orchestrates the murders of a mother and a child. I also call attention to the two central couplets of 5180 on Eros's genealogy, which adapt an old topos in which hard-heartedness is explained by a fanciful birth or rearing. The earliest example is Iliad 16, where Patroclus blames Achilles for abandoning the Greeks, <coughs> saying, the deep sea and steep rocks have given you birth since your mind is harsh. Adaptation of the tropos to Eros occurs in the Theocritus' idol 3, where a lovesick goat herd announces that now he has come to know the god, who was suckled by a lioness and reared in a thicket. In Eclogue 8, Virgil translates the Theocritus' noon and non to erota with nuncio quid, quid sit amor, a phrase that recalls the principal question in the Eropopoi Logoi. And he then alludes to the Iliadic passage by naming the distant mountains and deserts to be a birthplace of the boy god. In Virgil, there follows the reference to Cyrus Amor, who taught a mother to stain her hands with her own children's blood, apparently Medea. <laughs> the translation of Denos Eros in 5176, juxtaposed with the motif of Eros' association with actual killing that is reminiscent of 5180, suggests that Virgil filtered his version of this old topos through Meliager's epigrammatic sequence, much as he well suggested. We should also notice that while the topos is elsewhere a form of reproach, in Meliager it ironically accompanies the lover's abandonment of reproach. He now simply accepts that Eros' nature is derived from his mother, her male associates, and her own mother, the sea. These are the elements of the lover's destruction, as he abandons hope of delivery from the power of desire. The conclusion to the five-poem sequence is thus decidedly bleak, as love is identified with death itself. Well, I recognize so much of my shame that I have left out much that is in the tradition earlier and later and would like to develop it more elsewhere, but I just want to emphasize that my main goal has been to show that Meliager composed or at least arranged these five epigrams to serve as his perspective on the nature of Eros and that the sequence as such played some role in the transformation of the earlier Greek analysis of the god into the subjective accounts of pathetic lovers that we find in later literature. 